So I think I'm not alone when I say that most of us have been in this situation before. So take yourself back to middle school, maybe high school, whatever it might be, maybe at home. Um, situation is this. You are a decent student. You know, you, you do what you need to do. and But, you know, you also do dumb stuff with your friends, whatever it is. You break the rules, whatever it might be. One of your other friends get caught. And now teacher comes up to you, says, hey, Bobby. What happened over there with Johnny? What what was Johnny doing over there? And you know what? So that you don't get in trouble, what you end up doing is, well, you tell the teacher, well, you see, Johnny did this and Johnny did that, and I had nothing to do with it, miss. I had nothing to do with it. And she's like, okay, okay. She goes, figures out, and talks to Johnny a little bit. She comes back to you, though, and says, hey, um, hey, uh, you see, I know you're a great student and all. You, you, it looks like you don't do anything, but, like, you don't think I realize that you've been lying to me these past few weeks about X, Y, and Z and what Johnny did over there? And then all of a sudden you go from being, you know, this untouchable, amazing student that everyone thought you were to then now being, oh, wait, I'm just as bad as the other kid. And then everyone notices it, everyone sees it, and you are seen for your true colors. Well, it's a roundabout way of kind of comparing what the letters to the Romans is kind of like, actually. You see, the Romans, right? Oh, the letters to the Romans from Paul, this is halfway through his ministry at this point. Um, this is mainly directing to the Gentile Christians and the Jewish Christians. You see, the Gentile Christians, they're, they're Johnny. Johnny's the one who's getting in trouble. Johnny's the one who's just not being the, the straight-A student he should be. And meanwhile, Bobby are the Jewish people. Looks great on the outside, but really, in reality, is just as bad as everyone else. It's literally that to a T. And so this is what Paul is writing this letter to. You see, for the context for everything, um, the book of Romans, it was written in 57 AD. So this is really like midway through um, midway through Paul's ministry after his um, third missionary journey. So not midway through his ministry, but midway through the letters that he's written. So everyone really pretty much agrees that it was written in 57 AD. And uh, you see, the Roman church is actually not even a church that Paul planted either but it was someone it was a church that he knew and he heard about just in his travels from other people and the situation in rome at the time was a little bit weird and so uh the emperor of rome his name was claudius he took all the jews that were in rome took them out for five years scattered them all around uh, he didn't want them to be anywhere in rome but after five years he began to let them to come back inside and so now you have this church that was started five years ago, but even even before that, but then all of a sudden all their Jewish congregants were taken away. And so now the church was beginning to develop differently. And when the Jewish people came back from being taken out of Rome, they came back to their church and they realized, oh, this church is not at all what I thought it was before. It's, it's so different. And because they stopped following Jewish customs, they stopped doing the, the Sabbath, they stopped doing all these things that because they weren't Jews, they just didn't do. And there's nothing really wrong with that. But the Jewish people didn't see it that way. The Jewish people, they couldn't see eye to eye with the Gentiles, their fellow church members, their fellow congregants. See, the Jews believed that all of them had to be circumcised if they had to, if they wanted to be Christians. They debated whether or not they should keep the Sabbath or they should eat kosher and, and you know, stick strictly by that diet. And so they were divided by all these differences of opinion on how they should live as Christians. And so, like I said before, um, this is kind of like you know, you they're, they're pointing the finger, saying, "Look, you you don't know what you're talking about." You're, you're a troublemaker. You should listen to us. But in reality, what Paul's going to show them is that, look, both of you guys, both of you are in trouble. Both of you have no idea what you're talking about. And it's kind of just like that teacher trying to, trying to, you know, pick out what is the truth in all this and trying to just point out the fact that, look, both of you are immature. You have no idea what you're talking about. And so that brings me to the purpose of this letter. The purpose of this letter is to unify a divided church, and Paul is going to do that by explaining the clearest and fullest definition of the gospel that we have.
That is really what the Book of Romans really is. It is a amazing presentation of the gospel and what Jesus has done for us and now what we become when we believe in him. So we're going to divide the book of Romans into four separate sections. And the first one of that is the harsh reality. So in chapters one through three, Paul is going to speak to the Gentiles and to the Jews and share with them the harsh reality of their situation and just reminding them that, guys, you are not nearly as good as what you think you are. So in chapter one, Paul rips apart the Gentiles, which if you don't know what a Gentile is, again, uh, it is someone who's not a Jew. So if you're not a Jewish person, you are a Gentile. It's just as simple as that. And so he rips apart the Gentiles. He's like, guys, you go and you worship all these idols. You have no, you have, you don't respect your bodies at all. You're using them in all the wrong ways. You're sleeping with all these different people. You're worshiping all these idols. You do everything wrong. He just rips them apart. Just points out all the ways in which they are just horrible Christians, not doing anything right. Um, and so that's how he deals with it in chapter one, but in chapter two, he doesn't let the Jews get away with anything either. You see, they're just as bad as the Gentiles. And he points this out to them because they're the ones who are saying, you guys need to follow us and you know, you need to conform to the, these ways. And they think that they're better than the Gentiles. And Paul's like, no, like you're, you're just as bad. And he's like, do you want me to point out the last 2000 years before Jesus or the last few thousand years before Jesus, where you went off and you worshiped all these different idols and all these different gods and everything like that. And Paul's just like, just reminding them of the reality that no, none of them, neither of them are perfect. Neither of them are like good in the eyes of God. Both of them, both groups are sinners. Every single person in those groups. And though in chapter 3, in Romans uh, Romans 3, verse 23, this is what Paul says. He says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone. Everyone has fallen short. Every person has is unable to reach the, the height of perfection that only Jesus has been able to reach. And so now, that brings us to section 2, which is, the answer, which we can find in chapter four. Paul is answering this great need that we have for this horrible reality that we live in. See, Paul's not just going to point out to the Jews and the Gentiles all the issues that they have and how they're horrible people and just say, bye, have a nice day. Like, no, Paul's going to provide them the answer to this horrible reality. And what does he do? Well, he points them to Jesus. And through that, though, what he does is that he actually is going to refer to Abraham first. So if you don't know who Abraham is, really quickly, like the, the, the real quick version of it, is that God looked at God chose Abraham to be the man to start the Jewish people, right? And that through him, the Jewish people would come and the Messiah would come. And God promised that not only would those people be blessed, but every nation in this entire world will be blessed through Abraham. Well, the issue was, though, that Abraham, he was an old man. And so was his wife, Sarah. And so how can an old woman and an old man have a child together? It's just not possible. But God promised them. And so Abraham trusted in him. And that through that, that is where God worked through them. It is, it is Abraham's faith that God counted him as righteous. And you see, that is the thing that Paul's connecting here. It is the same exact thing for us. It is our faith in Jesus that counts as righteous before God, counts as sinless before God. Romans 4, verses 23 to 25 says this, Now it was not written for his sake, referring to Abraham, alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses, and was raised because of our justification. It is through Jesus' death on the cross, that we are now justified before God. We now have a case. We can now stand before him. Before we couldn't. We were sinful. But now belief in Jesus, he is standing right in front of us before God and approving of us. He's taken our sin, taken it upon himself, and is allowing us to go to heaven, to be with him, the Lord, as we are residing just in heaven. And it is only because of him. That is it. And so that is 
the that's the parallel that he's making that Abraham was kind of righteous for his faith. So are we, but in our faith in Jesus. And so now, though, that brings us to section three. So after we realize the reality that we are sinful and that we see the answer that is Jesus. Now, section three is the benefits that we receive as we have a walk with Christ, which is in chapters five through eight. So, I mean, there's an infinite amount of benefits, you know, for a, a walk with Jesus. There's, there's so many things you can name, but we're going to focus on a few that Paul points out in these chapters. And the first one that he points out is in Romans chapter five, verse one, and it is the fact that we can have peace with God. Romans 5 uh, verse 1, it says this, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know that the second greatest fear in all of the world, is it all of America or all of the world? I don't remember. I don't know. One of the biggest fears in all, in, in, in for people is death. I'm pretty sure it's number two. I forgot what number one is. I think it's heights. I can't Oh no, it's public speaking. It's public speaking. I think. Um, anyway, people are afraid of death. And you know what? That's really natural. I don't blame them. Death is scary. People don't know where they're going to go when they die. They don't have that certainty. You'll hear that all the time. Well, I hope this gets me into heaven and they do a good deed or something like that. They just don't really know or understand that. But the thing is, for us, we do. We have certainty because we have peace with God. You see, there's not this sin that's separating us from the Lord anymore, but instead, when we place our faith in Christ, He is the bridge from us to God. And so now, we are at peace. We don't need to be afraid of death because we know where we're going. What is 80 years in comparison to eternity? What is, you know, like, what is there to be afraid of? We don't have, well, I mean, obviously, you're, there are things to be afraid of, of course, but we don't have to be afraid of death because we have the certainty of knowing where we are going. And so that benefit of just not having to worry, that is, that's huge and affects every part of your life. Another thing that Paul points out is in Romans chapter 6, verse 14, and he points out the freedom that we have from sin. It says in verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. This verse is insane to even think about. The fact that with Christ, we no longer have to be the people we once were. We no longer have to say yes to every sinful desire we have in our hearts and every compulsive thing that we want to do. But instead, now we have the freedom to say no. We have the freedom to control ourselves. Our flesh has to control us, but now we have the freedom because Christ is influencing us. Christ is the one that's empowering us so that we don't sin. You see, it is through Jesus that now sin doesn't have this tight grip on us. But now all we have to do is further trust in him. And he will gradually and over time bring us away from those things that we're struggling with. Like it says in Philippians 2.13, For he is working in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. God is working in you. And is changing the desires of your heart. And so that we're not no longer those dogs that are going back to our own vomit, as the, as the Bible would describe us. But now we have the power to say no to these things that we know are bad for us. And as we also know, the Bible says that our hearts are deceitfully wicked. Who knows their ways? And that is how our hearts are. But now that we have the Holy Spirit inside of us after we believe in Christ, that is the thing that now we live by. Not our heart anymore, not what we want to do, but instead what Christ wants us to do, what the Holy Spirit is guiding us to be doing. So that freedom of sin, an amazing benefit that we have from Christ. The third thing that Paul points out, or, or a third thing that Paul points out, is in Romans chapter 8, in verse 1, and he talks about freedom from guilt. So verse 1 of 8 says this, he says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That verse is such an amazing promise. That verse is such an not even not a promise, but an amazing reality. In that, with Jesus, we don't need to condemn ourselves. 
When you're condemning yourself, you're beating yourself up for something. You're hating yourself for something. You're putting down your own worth because of the mistakes that you made in your past. When you condemn yourself, you're saying, I'm not good enough because of those mistakes I've made. I messed up because of A, B, and C, and I shouldn't live because of that. That's what it seems. And that's, no, that's not what it seems, but that is what it is to condemn yourself. But with Jesus, we don't need to do that. You see, we've been freed of that. There's no condemnation because Christ has forgiven us of those things. Christ has forgiven you of those things. If Why are you holding yourself to something that Jesus has already forgiven you from? Maybe you're struggling with condemning yourself. Maybe you hate yourself because of mistakes that you made in your past. Maybe it's because of the people you slept with and you're not proud of the fact that you did that. Maybe you're not proud of the fact that you did some drugs. Maybe you're not proud of the fact that you sent some photos to people that you really shouldn't have. Maybe you're not proud of the fact that you're completely addicted to pornography and you haven't spoken to anyone about it and you feel weak and you feel lesser because, well, something has control over you. Guys, beating yourself up over those things will do nothing for you. But instead, looking at the word of God and reminding yourself of the fact that, wow, I don't need to hate myself because of this. Because guys, think about it. The Lord's opinion of you is the most important opinion that there is in this entire world. God is the one who's created this world and has assigned things to have worth, right? God looks at you. He doesn't see sin. He sees his son. He sees Jesus. So think about it. You condemning yourself, that in and of itself doesn't make any sense. Because the thing that you're beating yourself up over, Jesus has already forgiven you of that thing. It's crazy. Jesus loves you. Christ brings freedom. He's the only one who could bring that. He's the only one who could free you from those things. That is the most amazing benefit that we have, or one of the most amazing benefits that we have, is that we don't need to kill ourselves over our past mistakes because Christ has died for those mistakes. And so now, section four actually perfectly fits into our series, seeing how Paul in chapters 12 through 16 gives us the how we are to apply everything that we just read. And so section four is the application. And so Paul starts off with verse one of chapter 12 to start the application. In Romans 12, verse one, he says this, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You see, this verse is where it all begins. It's, now we have to ask ourselves the questions, how do we actually begin to implement these parts, these things that we just learned into our lives? Guys, as Christians, we need to recognize, and you know, this is also for myself too, and for all the leaders as well, that our lives, the, the, the very thing that we're living right now, it's not ours anymore. It's not our own. Instead, it belongs to the Lord. It belongs to Jesus. And as Paul says, and well, it belongs to Jesus because he gave his life for us. Without him, we have nothing. But as Paul says, it is only reasonable. It only makes sense that we give our lives and service to him in light of everything that he's done for us. It only makes sense because of everything he's done that we would serve him. That we would give our life for him as he has done the same for us. And so now, Paul goes into what that actually looks like. So, and we're not going to go through all of this, but Paul in chapter 12 talks about as Christians, we should serve the church uh, that we are a part of by using the giftings that God has given us. That is part of our service to Him. In that we, we use what God has given us and we give back to His people in glory and service to Him. So Paul goes over in verse 9 of chapter 12, that you know we're that we are called to as Christians to hate evil and to cling what to what is good. That for us as Christians, we're not going to want to do these evil things, and but instead our life should be a reflection of Jesus, and so we should be clinging to what is good, to what is holy. In chapter 13, Paul directs us as Christians that we should obey our government, which I know is a hot topic right now because of everything, but 
at the end of the day, if Christ is the one, and, and Paul goes into the fact that how God is the one who has appointed the people who are in leadership to be in leadership, and how we should obey them, if God is the one who's in total control, and he's the one who's placed them in leadership to begin with, then what is there to worry about? God has our best interests in mind. Doesn't mean things are going to be perfectly easy and we're have the best you know, uh, economy and government ever. But if God is in control and he's the one who's placed them there, then we just need to exercise our faith and trust him that he's got this. That in this whole middle, the middle of this whole coronavirus, that he's got this and that it's going to be okay. But it's fitting that we would conclude with chapter 13, where Paul is directing um, where, where Paul is directing us as Christians to love our neighbors. Where this is kind of where this is the kind of main thing where Paul's trying to hit because this church is you know attacking each other. But in verse 8 of verse 13, it says, Oh, owe no one anything except to love another. That's a little bit weird wording, but I love how Paul puts it, where you don't owe, the only thing you owe to people is you need to love them. We each, every single one of us, owe something to each other, and that is that we need to love each other, and that's what it means to love our neighbors as ourselves. Our neighbors, by the way, Neighbors aren't just like, you know, the people who live across your street and right next to your houses. No, the, the context that the Bible's using here is neighbor is everyone. Everyone. Love your neighbor as yourself. But the thing is, you cannot love your neighbor if all you ever do is say the words, I love you. That's not enough. It's not enough simply just to say the words that I love you and not actually enforce and not have any backing with action in any way. To love your neighbor as yourself is not just to give lip service to them, but it's to go out of your way and to show them that you love them. Show them that you care for them. In this whole situation in America right now and the racial climate that we have in regards to these deaths and, and, and you know these murders and that's, that's happened, we need to just love each other better. I can't tell you all the all the amazing solutions to you know big governmental things to help you know, co- you know, combat all these, you know, the racial issues that we have. But I can tell you how the church can be the church. And that is we need to love each other like we love ourselves. We need to be willing to listen. We need to be willing to actually take action. We need to be willing to be a part of someone's life and not just say, yeah, I'll see you later. But no, actually go and see them later. Not just let things drop by. Outside of race, outside of all these things, just whomever you're next to. Love them like they should be loved. Love them the way that Jesus loves them, the way that Jesus loves you. The book of Romans is one of the most beautiful examples that we have of the gospel. One of the most beautiful explanations that we have of the gospel. It is Paul breaking it down for us. We are in a horrible reality where we are sinful. Jesus is the answer He's going to give he's going to help us live this life and then we are then we are called to then live that life. That's what it comes down to. And so how does Paul conclude? He concludes by talking uh, talking up these people that are in the church, talking about how how awesome they are, these leaders that are there and that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. Um and he just leaves them with this idea of loving your neighbor as yourself. That will help them not to be on top of each other constantly, to respect each other and their wishes, respect each other and their viewpoints as well, so that they can be a church the way that they need to be. And it's a reminder for us that we need to be the church everywhere we go. And we do that by loving people the way that Jesus has loved us. I love you guys. I'll see you soon. And a cool announcement coming in a few days. Bye.